$2 billion in sales, about 70% e-commerce, uh, we have about 5,000 full-time employees, uh, and then we hired additional 4,000 during our peak season, November and December, and uh, yeah, you know, we can sell a lot of stuff. <laughs> and he's wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, next is uh, Bob Montgomery Rice, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Bangor City. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Gurray, CEO and President of Bangor Savings Bank. We are the largest bank headquartered in Northern New England. We have 1,100 employees. We have customers in Maine, but also every state in this country, as well as we have uh, customers who have immigrated to 147 different countries. And we service them day to day. Um, and so I get the privilege to lead that organization. Next is Melissa Smith. Uh, CEO of Wex. Hi, I'm Melissa Smith. I'm CEO of Wex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Wex is a financial technology platform, or global. We have about 6,000 employees all over the world. And we are an about size. You know, when I first joined Wex, we were about 50 million in revenue. Last year, we're estimated around 2.3 billion. So growth is important to us. <laughs> I'm Josh. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep driving on. I, I'm Josh Broder. I'm the CEO of Tilson, and we're on a mission to build America's information infrastructure. And for us, that means we do all of the things necessary to connect data centers to computers and phones out in the world. So all the all the physicality of the internet is is what we do. And we're about a thousand employees working nationally, and uh, we'll roughly double that size this year. Uh, Hi, I'm Dan Fishbein, president of Sun Life US. Sun Life is a global insurance company based in Toronto. But here in the US, uh, the business I lead, we have about uh, 6,000 employees located across the country, including 500 here in the greater Portland area. Coincidentally, we are planning on moving into a building next door in a few months. Uh, and although we do business nationally and have offices all over the place, I'm based here in Maine and have lived here for 28 years, so I'm still from away. Uh, our business is, uh, in the US, is primarily employee benefits. So group life, disability, voluntary products, dental insurance, uh, stop loss. 
Thanks. Mike Simons, I'm with UNAM, and we are, I, I was actually a grad at Scarborough High School, but also not born here, so I'm still from the way down, I guess. <laughs> and uh, we're about 11,000 uh, people, primarily in the U.S., but also U.K. and Europe. Um, we cover about 45 million workers and their families through about 138,000 employer clients. Really? Excellent. So thank you all for, for coming, and uh, uh, let's launch into it. I'm going to have directed questions at each panelist, uh, and then we'll uh, open it up for general Q&A. Let me start with uh, Dan Fishbone of Southern. We have uh, worked, actually the Institute for Expansion AI and the Rue Institute worked with Sunlight on a project that covered the whole spectrum from identifying opportunities for AI in their business to picking a project and working on it to running a course in parallel. And I would say Sunlight for our students and our learners, uh, Sunlight went a step further and said, we're sending actuaries into this course because we want them to understand what the state of science and AI is all about. So I, I kind of love that project that they also gave us permission to talk about it publicly, which is great. Um, so um, could you share with us a major case study of an initiative that is important to your company's core business that uh, involves AI? Yeah, we, we have quite a bit going on, a number of different initiatives using AI right now. By the way, thanks for the comment about actuaries, because when we talk about data scientists, the insurance industry invented that. It's called being an actuary. <laughs> but, you know, there was a very important element there. Actuaries are very, very well trained in understanding how to use and manipulate data, but maybe not in some of the most, uh, you know, contemporary uh, programs to organize and structure that data. So training, our, you know, we have over 100 actuaries in our company. And training actuaries to use uh, contemporary data science is a huge opportunity for the industry and anybody in the educational side working on uh, data science. Um, one of the initiatives that I'll just briefly highlight that we're working on that uses AI is in our disability insurance uh, business. So uh, if you're a disability insurer, you have claimants who are out of work either for short term or long term. Uh, because of an illness or injury. And you have a limited number of resources, limited amount of resources to apply to working with those people to help get them back to work. And you can't necessarily interact with each of them in the same level of intensity. So we have to figure out where do we aim the resources so that we get the best impact. The people who are, you know, can be helped to get back to work, who want to get back to work, who are amenable to using the resources that are available. AI is a perfect answer, potentially, to that question. There's massive amounts of data that we have, much of it unstructured. For example, we take all of the phone interactions that we have with people. So we have an initiative right now working both somewhat with the Rue Institute, our own people, and an outside firm where we are listening to all those phone calls and then codifying all of that data and using things like tone of conversations even, frequency of conversations, and some of the content of those conversations to say, wait a minute, here's somebody that maybe you should be applying a different kind of approach to or a different level of intensity to because this is somebody who could get back to work and who maybe wants to get back to work. So that's just an example. There are certainly many others. Great. Thank you. If I may move to Steve. Um, as a retailer with significant physical and online presence, what are some of the ways you are using AI? Could supply chain, for example, would that be the most significant use case for AI? Or? Yeah, I can definitely, uh, from a supply chain perspective, um, we have about 80,000 SKUs, individual products, and on an annual basis, we move about 30 million individual units. And our forecasting team, I think for a long time, has been using machine learning our systems in partnership with Blue Yonder, we look at three years of historical data, of movement of every single product by color, by size, by channel, and then apply a recency factor to that and are then making our forecast for future purchasing. And to what you described earlier, which I love, which was AI-assisted human intelligence or human-assisted uh, computer intelligence, we take all that data and then our data scientists apply 
additional pieces of data that the systems don't know. Like there was a snowstorm, it was cold, it was hot, a catalog was early, it was late, uh, Google search terms were more or less expensive, whatever those things are that the system may not know, we enter that into our systems. The promise for, and all of that is algorithmic driven, the promise for us is to continue to have that structured data get into the system so that we are able to um, be much more predictive in those models and much more precise. And if we can put more data into those algorithms um, and we can see patterns that, that we can't find now. Is there an intricacy of that data that the computer systems can pick up that will show us a different pattern? And we need humans to then be looking at that, that level of data. So, Supply chain is hugely sophisticated for us. Uh, we're talking, you know, it's our single largest asset, $600 million a year that we spend on, on supply chain. The more sophisticated we can be, the more intelligent we can be, the better off. Um, so that's, that's definitely one major use case for us. And we have a practicum that we're working on with you around that same topic. And I, I love that example because it involves the humans in that. Um, turning over to Melissa. Uh, you said something last week, Melissa, that really stuck in my mind. You said, AI is more than nice to have, it is an imperative. Which, you know, hearing it from a CEO, like, makes my heart touch. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate on what leads you to this strong statement? Um, and, you know, how is AI changing your industry? And Sure. I am neither. And I think we've all seen what uh, changes can do both positively and negatively in the world. And AI to me has gone through a lot of change, but in particular over the last year, you can see that it is becoming more democratized and the fact costs are coming down, the ability to act but embedded in uh, apps that you purchase has gone up. And so I think that rate of change is only increasing. And so you're going to either be part of that or you're going to be left behind. And I'd like to be on the forefront of that. And the way that we're thinking about that, um, it's also a great mode if you can combine your data set if you're an existing company with AI. Um, you talked about that earlier, but uh, it really creates competitive advantage. We have about $600 million a day in transaction volume going through our business. That's just riches of data. I think McKinsey called it uh, raw material for a company like ours. And so if you can take that data, combine it, with the relationships we have with over 800,000 customers, it's, it's magic and we're deploying it in a couple of places now, but we see this as an arc. So we've got in-flight products right now that do things like help predict what's gonna happen uh, within customer behavior patterns and what's happening externally so that we can increase credit lines. We've got about $3 billion worth of receivables sitting on our balance sheet, but we wanna be intuitive about that so we know what customers we should be extending more credit to. We're doing that now, and that arc for us is going up into using that with other behavioral data so that we can be more anticipatory of what our customers need, which we think will reduce the cost, but also increase the intimacy of the relationships with other customers. So I, I think that the game is just you know beginning to change, and it's going to accelerate. Great. Um, turning next door to Bob. You know, we, we had the opportunity uh, to work with Banker Savings Bank with our AI solutions help here. Um, with your team, and we admire their focus on customer experience and customer trust, above all other considerations, which is a, an amazing culture. What role does AI play in achieving that, and what else do you do with it? Yeah, so let me take that a little bit even further. You know. We're extremely customer centric uh, to the point, and, and we've been recognized industry wide for the last decade for that by JD Power. But one of the challenges we've had is that customers, <coughs> when you become their trusted advisor, they want you to start to tell them their next move, but not in sell them the next product, but really help them manage their life. And so, as Melissa shared, as a financial company, you have a lot of rich data. But a lot of times that data is not used, but AI is allowing us now, and we've developed, um, with your help, a recommendation engine. So that we're taking all of that data and computing it, and now providing it to, whether it's our teller, or CSR, or a person out in the field, 
where that person that they're talking to is most likely in their life stage. Not what product to sell them, but where are they most likely at, so that then when they have a conversation, they can have a very rich conversation and really become that true advisor and really help that customer understand what might be the next best thing they do or not do. And so that's where, when you are a customer-centric organization, that's the nirvana you're trying to get to. And you know, we've talked about it a long time at our company and in the, inside the industry, and it's been something that's been elusive for us, but AI has really closed that gate, uh, that gap for us. And um, being able to provide that data in their mobile tablet for those people, uh, it's, it's just a piece. Uh, and it's going to really dramatically transform and tighten those relationships with our customers. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, not, not only a rich conversation, but a relevant one. That's very, very important. Um, turning to Josh, um, you have built Tilson from a small business to a national one, still with a significant, significant presence in Maine. How has the business environment changed over the last 15 years for a technology company in Maine? What do you think means advantage can be in attracting more tech? So our, our talent is uh, distributed nationally, but Maine remains our largest location. And one of the challenges we've had over the years is that as we try to do the work that we do um, for big telecom carriers in urban places, it's been uh, that the work that we do is not very affordable for small carriers in rural places. Like from the project. And so AI has taken the cost of designing a community at the conceptual level. Uh, the broadband network in a, in a community from about a million dollars to about 40 million uh, in the past 40 years. Um, and once you get to the $40,000 price point, then you need to get it really fully designed so that you can go apart with it and build it. And now you start getting back into the million. And so we get approached by vendors, and they say, hey, we figured that out. We can automate that. I say, great, I've got a building full of mayors doing engineering and CAD drafting and GIS work and other conceptual design. And how would you do it? And they'd say, I was talking to an Australian company the last time we had this conversation. They said, well, we have maps uh, that do it. And, uh, and I said, well, how much does it cost? And they told me how much it costs. And I said, that's like 80% of what it costs us. So like, how do you really do it? And they said, well, we do a long end in the buildings. Mm. And I said, well, that's not really AI. That's, <laughs> that's, just, that's just I. <laughs> <laughs> and so the short, the, the short answer to your question is I don't really know. Uh, I, I know that fundamentally the thing we do will be deeply disrupted by AI and will be disrupted in a positive way that will make the thing we do more affordable and accessible to other people. And so I have no idea where it's going, and I don't even know how we're gonna get from here to there. And so we're focused on the fundamental activity, which is starting to track the data in this manual expensive work so that we have something to innovate on top of. And put some people in the Rue Institute so that they can tell us how to do it. <laughs> 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 Um, let's turn off, oh, Mike, uh, Simmons, a question to you. Your team has been <laughs> deeply engaged with the Rue Institute in many projects. How big of a role is AI playing in your industry, and do you think it's possible to build sustainable competitive advantage if you are a leader in using advanced technology, such as? Thanks. So, really, two parts of the question. Yeah. Um, the opportunity in the industry, and then can you actually sustain it? Right? Which is important to me because I have a big competitor that's right next to me. Ear boss. So, you know, on the first one, and I thought the report did a good job of highlight of not only holding your microphone, but also highlighting, you know, some of the risks associated with it. And I made my microphone to be more like, well, what's the human outside of it? And, you know, I would take you back uh, to COVID and the peak of COVID. So what we, we do is we, our customer is the average kind of working person. About 60% of them live paycheck to paycheck. 
which means they don't get paid, they don't make rent, basically. Yeah. So when COVID hit, and you know, take a, just pick a calendar year, so, you know, 2021, we, we, we saw $100 million more life insurance claims come through, only physical. We saw 600,000 more people go out on disability. And we couldn't, couldn't show up for it. 700,000 people out on leave, right? And this is while our workforce was dealing with the same problems, the same issues, same challenges, transitioning to home. And so some of the things that um, AI enabled were just very, very simple things that proved to be so incredibly important in terms of like a reasonably existing firm. So the ability to sort of ingest unstructured data, and I saw Maine Health is here in a fantastic organization. Medical records do not come through in a particularly good structured way. We're trying to figure out you know, who's out of work and make sure that they get those paychecks, Andy. Um, I'm going working on it. Uh, <laughs> still a lot of positions, notes that are handwritten. Um, so just you know, really good uh, but basic technology that now is to, to take in that mass of claims and turn it around you know, that quickly. And then a little bit further in, you go uh, into the machine learning and then into some of the deeper models that are like, let, let us do eligibility all the way through. So understand, make sure that they are employed, and they've been employed for the time to be benefit eligible, and then make some initial uh, decisions around the duration, of the benefit. Uh, so all those things, are things like even in a normal time, like take you know weeks to get all done, they become level of days and hours to get done and be able to get done. So I think uh, the potential is huge. And, and Dan highlighted once on claim the ability to target resources to return uh, people resource or to uh, work, which is huge. And then competitive advantage, um, I think it is really about. Like, what we were talking about a number of, of the folks up here is like it's the combination. So any firm has to pick like what's your core competence? What are you going to compete on? If you're going to be sustainable, you have to pick one or two things that you're doing really, really good. And you know, for for us it's in, it's employee benefits and helping people that get sick or hurt, basically. And um, I was actually looking across the room and I don't know if he's still here, but John Ross is uh, John Ross in the room? Oh you there you go. Yes. Yeah. He's a very uh, Smile, I'm definitely one of the happiest people I know. <laughs> and um, I think, John, if I miss well, let me know. But I started as a disability benefit specialist about 15 years ago. You know, we just learned firsthand what it meant to take care of people when they get hurt. And I remember running into him at the gym at Unum. And he, uh, at some point, was, he went back to school and started um, getting graduate degrees. And now he's you know, data and analytics and helping progress, you know, progress our AI practice. It's really that combination of um, you narrow in on a competence, leverage the talent that you have, and apply it to its feet and land in a sustainable way. All right, so let's shift gears and now talk some about uh, talent. And at this point, I'm going to ask everybody to try to stick to the two minute answer. We're <laughs> <laughs> running out of time. Um, Melissa, you mentioned some significant growth anticipated in data science team that works. How do you plan to achieve that? And how do you balance kind of incoming fresh talent with experienced talent that understand the domain and the problem? Yes, but so we're going to double the uh, data science in, in the course of, of this year from um, what we've had historically. And I'm guessing, again, that's an arc that will continue. Uh, but I think it, equally importantly, we've uh, done a class work of education here for, uh, we call it a data class, where we're taking people into business and educating them about artificial intelligence and, and data science. And we think that that's equally important. We've also got an artificial intelligence center of excellence that's got set up, which is again, the purpose of that is really more educating people and bringing them into what's happening. And we've had for a couple of years uh, a governance committee that is really making sure ethically that we're doing the right thing. So when I think about the the resources, it's the buildup of the internal resources, but also circles of education. And, and again, making sure from a compliance and ethics perspective, we're using the tools in the way that we intend to. Uh, let me go to Dan, first of all. You know, you talked about the original data scientists being the uh, actuaries. 
Uh, how do you think about evolving and augmenting this talent pool to more effectively leverage new AI methods? Well, first, let me mention, you know, especially with Mike sitting next to me, something that's probably not well known. But there's a cluster here in the greater Portland area of disability insurance. This is the largest market in the world for disability insurance professionals. In fact, there's six or seven companies here uh, and more than 5,000 people in the greater Portland area who work in disability insurance on all the same kinds of things that both Mike and I were talking about. And there's numerous examples of the way, of ways that AI can make that a better experience for the member getting back to work, for the employer, for the, for the insurer. So I think there's a great opportunity, you know, and we're both doing it, and I think other companies should as well, for partnering with Root to educate our own employees in the, the principles of data science and the application uh, of artificial intelligence. So I think that's something for us all to think about, maybe even as you know, partners, is what can we do more broadly with the disability insurance cluster that exists here? Great. Steve, uh, last week we were talking uh, about emergent talent needs in your business when it comes to being data driven. You actually talked about the fascinating concept of a new type of operator, to use your words. Uh, how does being a main based business make this kind of talent need unique? Yeah, so uh, last week when we were chatting, it was, you know, we generally, for our business, we think about operations and operators. We think about frontline supervisors in manufacturing and fulfillment uh, in our stores. And you know, what's really apparent with our use of data, whether it's in our marketing team or supply chain team, is we need people who are able to operate with data. Um, and so earlier, looking for pattern recognition, being comfortable with complex data, um, and thinking about them as operators. You know, they're people who are generating insights and moving them through the organization and the business. Um, and it can be a huge um, competitive advantage for us. And here, specifically, you know, with you and with Ru, we think about our employees. So we have a number of our employees who are taking classes here, learning, getting comfortable with data. There's so much about demystifying uh, machine learning, AI, getting comfortable with data, getting comfortable with complexity. We have employees who are teaching classes in partnership with your faculty, um, and then we have Rue and Northeastern students coming into our business. And I think that crossover ultimately is about training, retaining, training, retraining, retaining um, our employees so that they are uh, ready for whatever's next um, on their lives and their careers. So um, all of that is around getting comfortable with data and operating in data, not just having it be something that's mystical. It's actually generating insights and then it's turning into like thoughts in the customer's hands. That's great. Great. Bob, um, I know for Vendor Savings Bank, you, know, you have the perspective that upskilling the employees is also important for employee retention. How do you go about developing effective upskilling programs in AI? How are you guys thinking about that? So, you know, we, in Maine, we have just a limited amount of labor, so you better be thinking about how you upscale them. And, and also to take the edge or threat of AI out of the workplace. And so, as you are, you know, not only doing things that Steve mentioned about having people come to the room, whether it's for degree programs or actually a course or certificate or just a learning, um, then thinking about the jobs that are at the more basic level and as you are moving through that, how do you take their skill sets and move them along, get them to have better appreciation for data? You know, all of this is dependent that we have true and accurate data sitting in our systems. So if you have a customer service rep, getting them trained about what data is, why it's important, then we're going to make good decisions. If you don't do that, bad data is bad decisions. And so your entire workforce and, and uh, investing into their education around AI is really important. And, and, and frankly, it's a threat if you don't take it real serious. Excellent. Um, let me turn over to Josh. Um, you know, Tilson's stated mission is to build American information infrastructure. Uh, how do data and AI play into that, especially with meaning? So one of the things that is a challenge for our business is that every day we solve the same problem over again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and every day we watch the knowledge of how we solved it 
spill on the floor and trickle between the floorboards. <laughs> um, and then we get up in the morning and we do it again. Um, and so because the thing we do is so expensive, um, imagine you're in uh, a city in Wyoming, a city that's four the size and doesn't have any telephone poles, and you have to get a fiber network out of the city. And it's the first time you're going to have that network, but it's not the first time people have put stuff underground, gas line, sewer lines, and everything else. And so all day long, really bright, really experienced people go outside and take a lay of the land and get some data, create some data, and make an assessment and figure out where they can thread that needle um, through the ground. And when we get it wrong, we hit something that it explodes. So for us, I think that the challenge for us is, is at multiple echelons. It, it's, it's obvious that the rule learners we have that one are our systems team in time will help us really think about this structurally. Um, but out in the field, I think we still are trying to figure out how do we sensitize a workforce that's gained their knowledge through hard one experience over the years to the value of that data and the capture of that activity of solving the problem so we can do something by just want to figure out how to train them at that. And somewhere in the middle, we're focused on education around analytics because we think ultimately we're unlikely to do a lot of fundamental research and development around AI for the applied apps, right? So um, we're going to buy stuff, but we think people with an analysis vocabulary and understanding of data will wind up being the users who will really figure out how to make AI seem for us when they buy those products. And the final question around Alan is to Mark. How do you build a data-driven culture and ensure the entire organization is using data effectively, not just kind of the elite, isolated data science team? Mm -hmm. Easy question. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think you really need to start with just based on understanding why the data is really important because it's often sourced and people distributed all over the organization. We just take that data and that decision. Um, yeah, I think you have to role model as leaders, like that you're going to face decisions on on good data and take the time to do that. Um, be a student, you know, ourselves, and have that expectation. I love it. I know everybody on this panel has spent a lot of time. You know, as things change, you got to stay current. But I think you know, all those things are going to boost. You got to hang around the room as much as oh, yeah. possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so right now is the kind of closing part, and it's the rapid fire portion here. <laughs> so now in less than a minute, I would like each of you to provide a concise, less than a minute, <laughs> as you think beyond your company and the future of the economy and education ecosystem in Maine, why is AI, from your perspective, something the state should be seriously thinking about? And I don't know whether we want to start left to right. Maybe we'll start with Steve, put you on the spot. Less than a minute, I'm going to time it. No problem. We've been right on time. Yeah. We have been yeah. on time. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple things really simply. So Maine was a net loser of population pre-COVID. We now have a positive population. But if we go back to those trends, we are the oldest states, uh, the oldest workforce. And hopefully we can hang on to our population. But we need to make sure that we can attract and retain young people to the state to begin their careers, that's critical for the state. And then for our existing workforce to continue to upskill them, we all have, everybody up here has very successful businesses with huge population uh, employee bases here in the state, and the more that we can upskill them to make our businesses even better competitively, so we're more successful economically, that's good for the state. So we need more people coming in and our existing people more well-trained, AI, ML, data fluency, all critically important to that. Um, so, as the banker, it's always about the economy, right? And, and everything we do actually has a big impact. So, Steve mentioned labor. Um, that's the most critical thing, keeping that skilled up. And if we can, for once, lead with something, Maine will then lead the state when it comes to the economy and growth of AI. And so, it is really exciting that the route is here in Portland and for Maine to lead and help us transform the state and lead through 
on what is really important to the future. Wonderful. 40 seconds. Ah, <laughs> wow. Melissa. I'm going to double on that. So, uh, this idea of leadership, it, it, we can't hire the type of talent that we're talking about anywhere in the world. I mean, it's, it's really hard to find uh, rich data scientists. And we have this opportunity here in the state of Maine. That's why I was so excited when the Brew Institute was established to be leaders, not just in the state, but actually in the world, with really putting all our effort together uh, towards AI and all of these higher education tools. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I would add that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm going to add to what Melissa said. You may or may not know, but Melissa and Wax are our landlord right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll, I'll borrow a page from chat GTP, which is to steal other ideas without citing them. <laughs> but because where you're sitting, you'll know who said this. Uh, you know, opportunity uh, is concentrated, but talent is distributed. and. Um, if we want to take advantage of the talent that we have, it seems like AI offers a fantastic payback for the investment. Mm -hmm. For relatively low offer, we can create a ton of value from here. Great. Yeah, so I agree with it, everything that's already been said. So what I'll do is I'll add something which also borrows from somebody else. So Angus King, yeah, in, it would have been 1996, uh, uh, came to a grand opening of an office uh, that I was at in Portland that had a grand total of 10 people, so it showed you, you know, what he was anticipating. And he said the following, in the future, people will work where they live instead of live where they work. Now is the future. That future is here. That was very prescient on his part. There's no better place to live than me. So there's no reason why we can't become uh, a center of AI or anything else that we want. Uh, I have a group of new neighbors where I live, and they all came from someplace else in the, since the pandemic began and brought their jobs with them. It's a great one. I don't worry. I'll go on Dan's point of why I think Maine should be and can be a leader, and I think Maine is an attractive place, but that's a great reason, Dan. Uh, I regrettably, I'll tell you that was a great reason. Because you're a competitor of mine. <laughs> uh, the other one is like, and it's uh, you can see on this um, panel here, and people that are in the room. Um, there's we have businesses that take us you know, all over, right? Uh, I think Maine's special, and I think there's just an ethos. It, maybe it's because of the long haul winners, or maybe it's the size of it. But um, there is an element of just community. So rather than independent, you know, organization, educational, healthcare, you know business, just a nat you don't have to drag us into it. It's like a natural inclination for us to work together to accomplish it. So I think that's a lot of reason for all. Thank you. And by the way, watching the clock, we're actually two minutes ahead. So <laughs> <laughs> this actually opens us up. Right now we're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A. So please, if you have questions. I don't know, team, I would love it if it was a microphone so we don't have to repeat questions. You can get it. But while we think about how to get a microphone into the audience, have to get questions from online. I'm going to go kind of off script and off feast. Uh, all of you know about me and Health, right? You know who Main Health is? So we, we are honored to have the CEO uh, of, of Main Health here. And I'm going to just impose on him, put him on the spot. Come on up, Andy, please. <laughs> He joined us yesterday for dinner and he kind of blew my mind with some of the ideas for AI in his business. But, you know, you don't get more than one or two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, like, how do you think about AI in your business? Sorry. Yeah, how yeah. do you think about AI in your business? Probably. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be critical to us. And I think it goes back to the labor question around the fact that we're going to struggle to generate enough individuals to do the jobs that we need to provide care for the community, but not providing that care is not enough. So one of the things that is really we started to struggle with is really the interaction with patients in the electronic health record. And that became increasingly important in the pandemic when we weren't able to physically necessarily go to the physician's office. But since that time, our physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants are really overwhelmed by the amount of information people were requesting through that. 
it's burning them out, it's creating frustration for them, and it's really consuming a lot of their time that prevents them from caring for all the patients that we need to. And so, yeah, Sam and I were talking last night just about a huge opportunity to think about using NLP to really help go through that data that they're all receiving. And if nothing else, help prioritize. What is the best next action to help improve the life of a patient? And so I think we're going to have to continue to think about how we can really employ that to ensure that we're, we're able to deliver the, the amount of care that we're going to be you know, asked to do. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy. <laughs> Thanks for accepting the challenge. Uh, number one, when he says Sam, he's talking about Sam Scarpino, who heads up our AI plus life sciences and utilizes a lot of the NLP technology and so forth. We are all using uh, NLP technology. Uh, number two is uh, we, we promised the, to the question session, and I saw one question here, so I don't know if we can get a, a mic over here. But I, I while, over. Okay, while the mic is walking over, uh, I'm a weird guy. When a CEO of a major health delivery system says NLP, it just gives me a thrill. <laughs> Do we have a mic? I only asked one question, so I'll skip to 30 seconds. Um, I'm interested in hearing about machine learning governance, AI governance, and making sure that when you deal with customers in particular, you're ensuring you know the side measure from a compliance perspective, from a privacy perspective. Be especially interested in hearing from Steve, given the inherent loyalty of developing customers. And, and for the benefit of the audience, just identify yourself. Oh, Kevin Petrie. I'm with uh, Eggerson Group, which is a research and consulting firm focused on data lakes. Thank you. And the question was around uh, data governance. So, um, I, let me talk about data governance, not around the AI and ML governance. So, for us, um, we have a precious customer database of 40 million um, customer records. And our data governance is really serious. And it is our chief legal counsel, our, our CIO and our chief marketing officer and our data sits within our marketing organization. Um, and they have a, a very formal data governance process that they go through any decisions we're making around our database, any use, we don't sell any of our data. Um, and then it actually reports into our audit committee officially. Um, so we have a report out on data governance, data quality, data cleansing and all that. Um, and so very, very active uh, management and protection of that data. There's nothing more important to us than that. And we're actually in the process of um, creating an entire, moving our entire customer database from mainframe to cloud technology in the next two years. And it's just a massive undertaking. And, uh, so this is something we take really, really seriously. Any mining of our data through AI or ML is done in-house um, through our own, with our own data scientists. Okay. Anybody else on the panel care to talk about maybe AI governance or data governance? Uh, Oh, that. I'll just add one quick thing. We, we established a set of data principles a few years ago and made it a major effort to make sure every employee in the company globally knew what they were. But one key principle we decided on, this was subject of a lot of debate, that was, was that we would never sell our data. So we use our data and keep it strictly confidential, uh, but we don't sell it. Other questions to the audience? I would just add, just that I think we've all touched on this. Governance is important to all of us when it comes to doing this. And then the piece about privacy and really making sure that if you tr are trusted by your customers, that you're not going to sell that data and you can stay on top of it. Uh, and you involve all levels of the company from board on down. And then just to the, to the AI piece of what you do with that data, I think a couple things more. But bias is something you have to watch really, really hard. So up to, uh, to the room that we've been working with on establishing really good methods to ensure that, or do the best you can to ensure that you're not introducing unintentional uh, bias into the models and reinforcing things uh, that, that you don't want to reinforce. That's certainly something you want to share. 
And thank you, Mike, for the plug. And we do have a responsibly high practice who engages on the ethical <laughs> issues and helping the companies. Part of it is we're trying to figure out what we should be teaching the next generation. Part of it is delivering that valuable service. Question? And identify yourself. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm Giovanna Pitoboni. I am the Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Maine, Arno. Uh, so if you were granted the wish that your data scientists have when they come in, like a skill or a quality, what would that be? Critical thinking skills. Um, the ability to track data and do things with it is just incredibly powerful and moving and it quickly, but ultimately our ability to make use of it is only as good as the critical thinking skills that are applied uh, to that data. So I, I just think at the primary education level and then at every level there, we, we'd love to see. And I'd add to that critical thinking skills, but business relevance, which is probably like another click on that same idea, but uh, to the extent that they understand business, that is really helpful. Uh, communication skills. I mean, almost always it's going to be collaborative efforts. So, that, you know, really, really good listening skills as well as the ability to sort of influence. Yeah, build on those communication skills to be engaging and really uh, engage the workers who are using the data and understanding, coming from a place of understanding with them. That should be easy. If you can just get all that. <laughs> 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 And we can actually use it by second quarter. <laughs> all, all that within engineering. So uh, I saw questions here. Because. Yes. My name is Anupit Gold. I'm a faculty in operation and supply chain. And my question is, there's already an anthem between uh, AI in cloud versus AI at edge. So what are your thoughts about uh, the approach that it should be that part of the higher approach? Ooh, a technical question. Yeah. So the question is, <laughs> doing AI in front of our analysis in the cloud versus doing it at the edge, meaning right where you collect the data. If any of you care to uh, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about that, because we built some of the edge infrastructure. Um, and the reason we're building edge infrastructure, this is moving compute closer to where the action is, to where people are interacting with computers and the devices, um, is that the networks that we build um, have latency. They don't operate in real time. It takes time to get from A to B. And so I, I think we are at the very beginning, the earliest days of the emergence of applications that are sensitive to this latency, this delay. Uh, and so having, having those decisions action closer to where the users are, I think will become increasingly important. It was the promise of 5G. It hasn't happened yet, but it's happening. It's the early days of this, and I think it will become increasingly relevant. And I will tell you, from an infrastructure investment standpoint, we, we are on the other side of uh, organizations investing billions of dollars in making sure that that edge infrastructure exists. And so big bets being made on this, the need for that infrastructure. The other answers? We'll go to the next question. So as, as the uh, executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI, my answer is do it in the cloud, do it in the edge, do it in the fog in between, do it <laughs> frequently, and do lots of it. OK, two more questions. Oh, there's one there already. And then. Uh, I have uh, Tom Law from National Instruments. Uh, I guess this came up earlier, but I think Maine is in kind of a unique position where Maine companies care about privacy. And that's potentially a big branding opportunity, especially if we do something with policy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about thoughts on that? Oh, easy questions. <laughs> Anybody want to think? I think, Steve, you talked some about the privacy of the Yeah. What about policy? And over the time, I mean, so data privacy is a huge issue for us. California is leading data privacy with their Data Privacy Act, which has forced all e-commerce businesses to really 
change uh, how customers can access their data. They can uh, they can delete their data. They have the right to be forgotten. They have the right to review all of their data. Um, and so when their privacy CCPA went through, we all had to adapt to that standard. Now every state is creating their own new privacy, and Maine's um, is coming through as well. Maine's is less. Um, aggressive than, than California, so it's fairly easy to, to apply. Um, so, sorry, I don't have about Maine leading on this. What we are wishing for is actually a federal solution to this. <laughs> um, because it's incredibly difficult. You have to see where a customer's coming from and then present different, um, different um, screens to them uh, through the e-commerce environment, depending on the state they're coming through. And they're all different, and we have to manage through all of those, and it's actually quite labor-intensive. So we would love to have a federal standard, a high, very high federal standard, and we follow California if you want. I'm not sure if it's an area where Maine can lead, or, um, but it's, a, it's an area of, of high annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, can I clarify a little bit? I guess what I meant is there's a different what I meant is that I think there's a difference between compliance and kind of what people want to do. And there's an opportunity where I think mayors care about that privacy, not just compliance. As, a, as an example, main ban in the use of facial recognition technology in public the how dry it would be. That would definitely be everything. But I don't know. Any answer? Otherwise, we are. Well, and I, I would say that that is hard. I, the way that I think that it just introduces a lot of complexity from a business perspective. So we're sitting on the other side of that saying, like from a global perspective, you introduce even more um, standards. And the way that, that we're thinking about that is almost you take the, the hardest one and that you deploy that as your minimal standard across to try to simplify as much as you can. And, you know, Simplification just makes things better from uh, the end user perspective too. And I, when you think about Maine, I think Maine has led in many different ways. And I, but I don't know that we would be the leader on this. I think there are some pretty high standards that are out there already. Okay, the last question over here. We need to keep it to one minute. Question and answer included. <laughs> What's that? Hey, I'm Tyne Wallace. I'm with um, DataKind and also the Life Flight Foundation. And I'm hearing you all talk, first of all, awesome pair, so thank you. Um, I'm hearing you all talk about using the AI to drive profits. Uh, in your companies, you see the AI to drive social Yeah, I mean, I think for us, <clears throat> sorry, but it's really good when your core product or service has a very positive social impact. So when you can serve more people and you can get to them more quickly and you can get to them more efficiently, so you're taking less out of their paycheck to pay for their benefits, that's a huge win. Um, I do think, and I know this isn't exactly the thrust of your question, but I think it's really important too to think about the average job. And some of the reference in the Kinsey report about automating away the workforce. And I have a different take, which is just about everybody's job, my included, panel included, has a, a, some portion of the work that is just money. And it's mind numbing and it's soul crushing. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Should be done, Should be done by robots. Not and by this is what people want to do. This is what again fired up. It wasn't it isn't what fills their bucket. So I do think that there's a huge opportunity to elevate the work that people do. And in doing so, I have never paid one on work that's huge for social value to it. So that, that would be another I think to it. Okay, so as we come to an end and before I wrap up and thank our panelists, uh, you met two of the three musketeers. I want to hand it over to the third musketeer or the first, I don't know. Chris? I wanted to say one word. 30 seconds. Hi, um, everyone. Chris Mallet. And Margaret mentioned uh, our third anniversary of the Root today. And all of the leaders and the organizations before you here, including others who are in the audience, are colleagues from JAXA, from Maine Health, from IDEX, from the Study, and PTC, were with us three years ago across the way. Uh, and we're among the first people, um, frankly, to make commitments and investments in Northeastern's efforts. 
-hmm. in various ways, by giving us your business and your opportunity, by supporting your learners, by opening your doors to us, Wilson, when you were homeless, and saying that <laughs> afternoon we may be able to help you with this campus thing you need. Um, and three years later, you know, you're leading among this community, and, and we celebrated a little bit this morning with our team, and we rewatched Dave Drew's remarks. He talked about, uh, you know, what a long game we're playing here. And I just want to thank all of you on behalf of everyone in the Eastern and everyone in this room, and all and those other partners that I just mentioned, for believing in this opportunity and being with us then and being with us again today. So thank you to you and, and all of your teams for your leadership in this community. So please join me in thanking our panelists. They took their valuable time, showed up here, answered some very tough questions, shows you the level of engagement and commitment. I love it. Uh, made me very happy today. Um, so please, please join me in thanking our panelists. And thank you.